Little Britches' father and I were ranchers. Today we're going to finish reading chapter 29. Of course, everybody was pretty sure that the shooting was because father had proof in court about the water stealing. But the sheriff said there was nothing we could do unless we could prove it. And we never could. Hang was over at Cooper's in early September, and until school started at the end of the month, I worked at the mountain ranch with High. It was fall branding time, and High was too busy to spend much time with me. I was homesick. Of course, I knew that if somebody was going to shoot at Father again, my being there wouldn't stop him. But I got it in my head so much that I couldn't think about anything else. And about two or three times, High had to scold me a little because I forgot to take water to the fellows up in the canyons. I'd been so busy thinking about riding in the Labor Day Roundup that I didn't notice things around our place the way I should have. It wasn't until I came home that middle Saturday night in September that I noticed Billy was gone. I might not have even noticed it then if it hadn't been for milking. Lots of fellows don't like to milk, but I always did. It seemed as if milking was the time when Father and I were kind of away by ourselves and as if he belonged just to me. He always saved milking on Saturday nights till I got home. Right after supper that night, Father picked up the big bucket, the one he always used for the Holstein, and lit the lantern. When I started to pick up the Brendel's bucket, he said, Grace is curious to know how you tell which calves on the open range should be branded with the YB mark. Suppose you tell her while I do the milking. I'll only be a jiffy. Then he put the lantern over his arm and went out. I knew right then that there was something wrong. So I told Mother I'd have to water sky high before I left him for the night. It was a story, though, and I never did it. I went right out to the barn where Father was milking. Brendel wasn't there. Father heard me come in the door, and I guess he knew what I was thinking, as he always did. He had his head against the Holstein side, and he didn't look up, but said, Old Holstein's holding up so well this fall, it would be a waste of fodder for us to keep two cows. So I let Mr. Cash have Brendel. It was then that I noticed I was standing right in Billy's stall, and it was dry and clean. I don't believe I even thought before I said, Did he take Billy too? Father didn't say anything till he got done stripping Holstein, but the bunches of muscles were working out and in on the side of his jaw. Then he set the bucket over and turned around on the milking stool, so he was looking right at me. Partner, he said, we might as well look it right in the face. We're not going to make it here. We haven't enough feed to see two head of stock through the winter, and I haven't had but five days outside work all summer. The court has only given us damages for 10 acres of crops, and that's all we're entitled to, because we have rights to only 10 inches of water. It won't amount to much more than you've earned with Mr. Cooper. I wanted to say something, but I couldn't think of anything to say, so I just stood there. In a minute, Father hung the stool up on the peg and rumpled up my hair. Don't worry about it, son, and let's not worry, Mother. There's always a living in this world for the fellow who's willing to work for it. And I guess we're willing, aren't we? Let's go in and pop some corn. Fred Altlin brought me home from Cooper's the last Saturday before school started. He was there at the home place when I came in from the mountain ranch and waited for me to change my clothes and get my things together. Fred and Mr. Cooper were talking out by the cook shack while I was getting my things packed. It was hot and the window was open, and Fred was talking so loud I couldn't help hearing him. Damn bullheaded Yankees, he was saying. God and everybody knows we'd never got a dime for our crops if he hadn't rigged that water gauge at the ditch head. And there he stands, with $120 in his hand for a year's work, and too goddamn proud to take a bale of hay from a neighbor. What the hell are you going to do with a man like that? I knew he was talking about father, and I knew father wouldn't like it. So I grabbed up my suitcase and went out without even saying goodbye to Mrs. Cooper. Father didn't get home that Saturday night until after I did. 
he was helping a man build a house over west of Denver. From then till Christmas, he just came home Saturday nights and left before daylight Monday mornings. He did stay home a few days in the middle of December, though. Hal got pneumonia on my 11th birthday, and until Dr. Stone said he would get all right again, father didn't go back to work. I never did know who bought Nig or a lady's two-year-old colt or the wagons and harness. Grace told me who had bought some of our things, but all she knew about the others was that father had taken them away and hadn't brought them back. I never asked him because I knew he wouldn't want to talk about it. When the West Denver job was finished, he let me stay home from school one day, and we went down to Fort Logan to settle up the grocery bill with Mr. Green. It was $86, and Father let me put up my last check from Mr. Cooper in on it. Just before Christmas, he got another job. That time it was helping build a big house in Littleton. It seemed as though our best Christmases were the ones when we were the poorest. Mother had saved a turkey and we had all the things to go with it. Packages from our folks back in New England and father must have brought the tree with him when he came home on Christmas Eve. Mother had it trimmed with cranberries and popcorn strung together on long strings and there were half a dozen oranges hanging from the limbs like colored lanterns. The presents were wrapped in white tissue paper and tucked in under the tree the way they always were. There was one sled with Grace and Muriel's name on it and another for us boys, and everybody got new shoes and stockings. It snowed all Christmas afternoon, and nobody came to call. Mother had made a big plate of fudge, and we popped fresh corn and divided the oranges into sections. We had to do it that way because there were only six oranges, and there were seven of us. At first, Father said for us not to divide them because they always made his teeth sting. But Mother just laughed at him, and we divided them anyway. I didn't see him shinny up his eye when he ate some of the sections either. Mother got a new book for Christmas called When Knighthood Was in Flower. She must have read us a hundred pages of it that afternoon and evening. And we'll read chapter 30 next time. Till then, as Tigger says, ta-ta for now. Thanks so much for listening. Love you guys. Bye-bye.